All right. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we're uh, blessed to have in our presence uh, today uh, a friend, a colleague, and another uh, longstanding veteran of the membership, alternative practice, functional medicine, uh, integrative medicine fields. Uh, Tom and I both have been in the industry for a long time, uh, particularly in the concierge space. Uh, so I'm excited to have Tom join me for a, a conversation. It would be a fireside chat, but there's no fire. I don't think Tom has a fire in his office either. <laughs> and uh, I'm excited to have a, a great conversation about a recent survey that Tom brought to my attention uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we were really interested in, in some of the findings. Uh, it's a self-reported uh, study that was conducted. Uh, and uh, without further ado, Tom, uh, let's, let's have a chat and, uh, and uh, discuss this survey and the findings and, and see how it relates to membership uh, style practice in medicine. Yeah, yeah, happy to. So, so the, the story of it is, uh, you know, when the pandemic hit, it, it, um, you know, it, was, it was clear that this was going to have a, a heavy effect on independent practices. And um, some colleagues and I uh, that, uh, that I've worked with forever decided back in March to stand up a uh, sort of a resource site for independent practitioners, mostly in the root cause medicine sort of arena. And, um, you know, to help them sort of make the, accelerate their evolution into what really has, is probably going to be our new reality for a while, uh, if not indefinitely in some ways, and, and at least as, as it relates to, to medical practice. So anyway, about six months into it, back in August, we, you know, we thought to ourselves, well, it's, it's probably a good time to kind of take the temperature of the practitioner universe, see what the, the impact of COVID has been on practices, um, and uh, you know how far have people gotten in their in their transitions, and and what have we and what have we learned? And so, with uh, with the help of I don't know more than a dozen different different kind of collaborators in terms of sending this survey out, uh, industry and education collaborators for the most part, we um, you know we fielded what I think was probably the largest survey to be you know, to be ever conducted in the root cause medicine space. We had thirty five hundred and five respondents to this, and. Um, and across a host of practitioner types, but each was, I mean, we had a ton of MDs and DOs and, and, uh, and nurse practitioners uh, to, to respond. So it gave us a really great, great look into things. And there, the, the takeaways were, and, and, you, and, and, and there's actually a lot of slicing and dicing that we can do on this, but the big takeaways from this were, um, well, actually, I'll do, do it this way. I, I want to, to, to sort of sensationalize it a bit, I, I, I will cast this against the backdrop of, of another survey that kind of coincidentally was you know, occurring almost at the same time, maybe a few weeks earlier, which was the uh, the Merritt Hawkins Physicians Foundation uh, survey of the whole physician universe. So they poll about a half a million physicians. Their survey got about 3,500 respondents as well. And what they learned was uh, they, they, they observed that, number one, physicians generally felt like, boy, the pandemic is going to wreak havoc on independent practice. Something like 59% of these, of these physicians said this is going to hit independent practices really hard. They also discovered that 8% that of their respondents had reported having temporarily or permanently closed their practice, with another 4% anticipating having to close the practice in the next 12 months. Now, when you drilled a little deeper into that, what you found was is that 76% of the practice closures actually occurred uh, among independent practices. So, in, in fact, uh, you know, the pandemic had, as we would all imagine, the independent practice is much harder. So, so when you kind of did the math on that, it's a little under 15% of independent practices at that time had temporarily or permanently closed. When we looked at the practitioners in the root cause sort of medicine arena, and by that I mean functional integrative lifestyle medicine, very much the type of, uh, you know, the type of medical care that you guys are, are sort of set up to support, <clears throat> the, um, what we found was is that the, among MDs and DOs, uh, sort of looking apples to apples, the, the temporary or permanent closure rate was only 2%. So right off the bat, what, what we saw was, was the, you know, sort of, sort of very clear evidence that the, both the consumer appetite for that type of medicine, as well as the relationship that that type of medicine creates with, with people was, you know, proved, you know, proved more sticky and, and more engaging and people were more inclined to, uh, you know, to, to, to remain engaged even in the weird disruption of the pandemic. So then when we slice this by business model, what we saw was really quite fascinating, which was, you know, absolutely the, you know, the triumph of what I would call value-based payment models in the retail world, which would be number one, membership, and number two, a really interesting one, 
uh, that, was, that has been sort of emerging for a while is the use of bundled programs, potentially even in combination with membership. But what was wild was the, among the membership practices, A, there were zero closures in the, in the sample. And, and we, had a, we had a good many membership practices to respond. So that was, that was really exciting and validating and, and just nice to see. But we also saw 24% of membership practices actually in 2020 are doing better than ever. Another like 40% were completely unaffected by COVID. So, you know, their revenue didn't, you know, didn't change a bit. And so what we essentially kind of can take from that, I mean, you got, what is that? 64% of membership practices are right, yeah. Yeah. better than they ever have. And, uh, you know, and we did not see that kind of success in any other, you know, either insurance-based, cash-based fee-for-service. There was no other model that, that even approached, uh, you know, the, the, you know the, the kind of protection that that membership engagement uh, relationship seemed to provide. And so, you know, it's, if you think about it, it's, it's understandable. If you, I mean, if you're in a, if you think about it from the patient perspective, pandemic hits, world comes to an end, the news says, don't go to the doctor, don't go to the hospital, stay home. If you're in a fee-for-service medical relationship, you know, the first thing that you think of is, well, geez, how long can I go without healthcare? If you're in a membership relationship, you're paying every month, your selfish reaction to this is likely something like, well, geez, you know, what's going to happen? So this isn't a waste of my money. Am I, you know, right. and, and you wait and you listen for the practice to say, hey, we have telehealth or here's how we're doing things. But, but logically, a pandemic is a stupid time to fire your doctor. And That's so right. people paused, allowed practices to adjust stayed engaged and valued the relationship. And, and it has, you know, just, it's really just, I think, elevated the membership model to a real, a, just a new and, and, and incredible place, I think. Yeah, and I think we, and I think when we spoke uh, a couple of weeks ago about this, I had reflected to you that we have observed exactly the same uh, type of uh, behavior and findings and durability and the power of the relationship, all of those factors uh, coming to put into in full light and and also the uh, you know um, and the kind of uh, uh, you know insulation of having uh, a different type of relationship that's not built on a transaction yep uh, you know that that kind of sustained subscription based level of engagement where it's more about uh, having a retained relationship than it is about the encounter uh, that has once again proven itself to, to be uh, a very sturdy uh, construct, uh, and, and I will also say that the the model itself, uh, from our observations, of course, it creates all additional time, which allows providers to be not responsive, but proactive in reaching out uh, to their uh, members, uh, particularly in a trying time like this. And, and I can tell you because we we handle a, a good deal, if not all, of our member communications for all of our physician partners. And we, uh, and, and we drive some of that ourselves and we also respond to our physicians uh, and our partners' desires to, to have outbound communication in a proactive fashion. And that was the, you know, most demanding and busiest, uh, uh, you know, component of what we were doing through the early stages of the pandemic. And now that it's settled in in terms of being able to deal with it in, in a bit of a rhythm, um, that remains the truth. We're, we're providing updates, we're providing content, we're providing engagement. We're also seeing that our physicians are extremely proactive about that. Yep. Um, so it just creates a different level of connectivity. So, uh, you know, your, your thought and, and observation that, you know, it's a terrible time to fire your doctor. I think, I think that's absolutely true. And the counter to that is, oh, it's a great time to great time to hire your doctor yeah. and hire a doctor, which is exactly yeah. what we've observed. Our growth from, uh, you know, external member uh, signups and mem members outside, of, folks who become members outside of our practices, um, has been, uh, you know, unprecedented. Uh, it, it really has been uh, a significant increase uh, year over year uh, for that type of activity in our practices. So. You know, I think it lines right up with what your observations were. I think you also commented, uh, and I looked at the, the survey, of course, and, and looked at the data. Um, to speak to uh, the mortality uh, observations as well as hospitalization observations that were, were seen in this. Yeah, uh, yeah, study. this was fascinating. So, 
you know, it, it's uh, we, one of the one of the dimensions of the survey had to do, of course, with you know, with with COVID and, and health outcomes in particular. And we asked the uh, we asked patient or, or practitioners to report on, uh, you know, everything from the number of you know COVID cases that they have all the way to the number of of, of uh, you know COVID deaths. And and when we looked at the the rate the the number the percentage of of COVID patients that were hospitalized. And then the percentage of COVID, COVID patients that, uh, you know, that, that died, self-reported, of course, uh, we saw a, a, a remarkable difference between the, uh, the insurance-based practices and the membership practices, which was that the rate of hospitalization was about a third amongst the, amongst the membership practices. And interestingly, the death rate was maybe 40% what it was in the other practices. And so I really kind of wrestle with this. The, the hospitalization one didn't, you know, didn't strike me as, as terribly surprising because as we've seen on television, kind of the, the order of the day has been, okay, if you, you, if you have COVID or even have symptoms of COVID, the, the protocol is go home, isolate, kind of wait and watch and see what happens. And if you sort of start having real trouble breathing, go to the emergency room. And so what we were seeing, of course, was you know, were, were, were patients panicking and, and going in and out of the you know, emergency room from a health plan standpoint, driving up lots and lots of health claims. Um, and, uh, and so, of course, having access to a doctor that's following you more closely, you know, it, it, it stands to reason, which is also to say, you know, anybody that is, you know, that, that's, that's on, the, um, on the underwriting side of those healthcare costs would be, would be delighted to have COVID patients in the care of a, of a private physician and a membership practice for this very reason. It's a huge, huge money saver. But the other thing, now, as I've talked about this, there are two other things that I thought were really quite interesting about this. One was membership practices, as we discovered, are, are very disproportionate to other practices in, in establishing sort of a specialty beachhead around cardiovascular risk management. Way yeah. more carotid IMTs, way more use of, of you know, Cleveland Heart Lab and Boston Heart, we have advanced cardio labs. And, and of course, as time has gone by, we've seen that, you know, that COVID, uh, you know, some people would you know, say is almost like a vascular disease. And so, and so you know, managing inflammation, things like this, it, it, I, think, I think gave these doctors a leg up. One other thing I would say, because there will be people that listen to this and are like, well, membership, right? It's a socioeconomic thing. And, and what you have to remember is, is that we were polling practices that were entirely root cause practices. So the, the, you know, many, most of these practices were in some form of private pay medicine. And, yeah. and, and even those that are insurance-based, what we know about those patients is that they, they skew far more affluent, far more educated. So I don't think there was a dramatic socioeconomic difference between, you know, between the patient populations. I know we could, because we asked, there was not a huge racial ethnic difference among the patients. So, so I do believe that this, you know, that this had, had a lot more to do with uh, probably to an extent, some of the training the doctors have invested in above and beyond right. their basic training. And of course, the, the connectivity that the model provides. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think, uh, and the vast majority of membership practices, uh, in spite of what some of the, you know, public uh, presentation may be by the media are, are actually, you know, very affordable. Uh, they're in the anywhere from 100 to, to $200 a month. Right. Uh, you know, range. Um, and, and in some instances, uh, there's some gradation, um, you know, uh, based on certain characteristics that, you know, really make it very affordable. So, you know, it, there is a certain socioeconomic strata that's represented, but, but it's not, I think, what most people would, would believe it totally. to be. You know, uh, it really ends up being about folks who have prioritized their relationship with their physician um, and, and who understand that they have that focus on prevention and you're right, and I also appreciate the fact that their physicians have decided not to, you know, kind of maintain the status quo. They've invested uh, both in themselves in terms of becoming uh, more informed and, and uh, you know, more capable providers in the preventative space, um, you know, and in the integrative space. I think, and you can see in many ways that that's coming uh, to fruition as as the primary care system is being pressure tested, particularly in, in uh, membership style practices. Yep, yep, totally agree. Hey, one thing I was interested in, in, in asking you to talk about was, you know, in, in, the, in some of the webinars I've been doing over the course of this time, I mean, it was kind of easy to anticipate that membership practices would perform well yeah. uh, compared to others. The, um, you know, and, and so in saying that to people, I've been, I had been reluctant to, 
uh, to say that this was an opportune time to convert the practice just because I, you know, I didn't know what the optics of that would look like or what have you. You know, you had mentioned that, that you guys actually started doing conversions back in July, clearly against the backdrop of practice closures that have now been quantified by the Physicians Foundation survey. You know, there's a, there's a strong rationale and a, and a very clear message that can be brought to patients. But I, I, I'd love to hear stories of conversion, you know, since the pandemic. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and uh, you know, as we discussed before, uh, you know, when, as we were entering, uh, you know, uh, May, June, we had had a, a backlog of folks who had previously signed up to do their conversions. And, and we, of course, had been holding off on executing, um, for the most part, on, on all of those practices. We had had some that we had started earlier in the year, and of course, we were finishing them through the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and, and, and we had been observing that there really hadn't been a negative impact. As a matter of fact, it had accelerated the rate of signups, of course. And you know, one could say, well, again, folks are wanting to maintain their relationship with their physician, and that is true. I, I, but I think that the, the, you cannot ignore what the direct reports from those patients has been and, and was at that time. Um, they are very excited about the opportunity to cut out the uh, you know, uh, interference and the inability um, to connect directly um, with their physician. It, very, very supportive. We've had a number of town hall uh, you know, Zoom meetings with uh, our physicians who are converting. Uh, as well as their um, patients who, who uh, attend. And, you know, I would tell you that the, the enthusiasm and the energy behind that um, from those folks has been uh, really impressive. And I think it's against the backdrop of what they're seeing uh, being and what they are being exposed to by having to, to go to larger systems for care yeah, having yeah. to go for testing, et cetera, all of those kind of encounters with larger systems make them appreciate that that really closely held relationship all the more. So directly to your question, um, as we started to more actively engage in doing conversions and rolling out um, our practices um, that were previously in a traditional um, style of engagement with their patients, um, and we start to do our conversion process, which is to inform and invite um, their patients to become members of, of a, a newly formed concierge membership program. Uh, we have been uh, in, really uh, amazed at the response um, from uh, those patient communities. Uh, as a matter of fact, in this last period, last quarter, now as we enter the end of the year here, um, you know, we are on track to have our, our best year in terms of signing up members. Wow. So, uh, you know, I think it really has pressurized the system in such a way that, you know, patients are valuing that relationship all the more. Mm -hmm. uh, th that being said, you have to handle it with great care. You have right. an obligation not to create a scenario where those patients uh, feel that they're in any jeopardy of not having their relationship um, during this um, a time of pressure. So we've handled it slightly different. We've, we've made our conversions uh, more lengthy, mm -hmm. uh, given more time. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, also, uh, you know, really focused on um, staying, uh, you know, more in touch with those individuals. You know, there's a certain communication cadence that we normally, uh, you know, use. And we've changed that um, uh, in a way that I think is even more um, uh, communicative, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, and that has allowed folks to kind of relay their concerns. We've also, of course, done our usual uh, good job for folks who are not going to stay with the practices to make sure that we connect them and we have a, uh, even a wider array of folks to have them move forward with in a traditional format. So uh, to answer your question succinctly, uh, yeah. it's definitely been um, a really interesting response and, and one that um, we weren't sure of, of what was going to happen, but it's been very, very positive. Nice, nice. Well, you know, I mean, it, it certainly seems to me that this is a, uh, this is a great, in light of what you've discovered, and, and frankly, I do think that, that the just circumstances around the independent primary care practices nationwide really kind of invite doctors to, to adopt innovative approaches to maintaining you know, and sustaining the independent practice and, 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 better, and better serving patients. And this is just such a, a phenomenal way to do it. And, and to hear that you guys have fashioned a way to communicate about it in a way that doesn't 
ruffle feathers and 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 cause issues. It's it's I mean it's just it's it's actually kind of very exciting, you know, to hear that. Yeah, it really comes down to you know the the, the reality that you know we're in the communication business more than anything else. Yep. Um, whether we're communicating information about uh, prevention or we're communicating information around. Uh, you know, uh, the conversion of the practice or the change in the level of engagement right. with the provider. But ultimately, it comes back to communication in that we are providing a platform and a capability and a level of connectivity and collaboration that only exists in a membership style practice. Uh, yep. I'd be so bold to say. <laughs> and I, I think that's agree. what we're seeing. No, I think I that's what we're seeing. And we're seeing that uh, it is, uh, you know, very durable. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's very exciting for both provider and for, for patients. Um, and, uh, and I think we'll see uh, even more compelling outcomes data and uh, utilization data that reinforces that as we move forward. So I wanted to, to say thank you. Uh, so wonderful to chat with you. Uh, and, uh, and we will keep the uh, lines of communication open to end Absolutely. on the communication note. And you'll let us know your additional findings. And as we find uh, and discover more about how this is unfolding for us, we'll be sure to share it back with, with you folks as well. Oh, well, wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you, Dean. Great to see you as always. Great to see you, Tom. Take care of yourself. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.